Well, good morning, Macquarie Life Church onlineers. It is so good to have you with us, and wherever you are, we are so glad that you have decided to join us at this time. I've recently just got back from Sri Lanka, and I love that even overseas in somewhere like Sri Lanka, I can actually、uh, tune in to Macquarie Life Church online. And while I'm talking about Sri Lanka, it's so good that we got to take a team from Macquarie. Macquarie was invested financially into that as well, so and we had a great time. And、uh, I'm sure you might hear more about that in the future. But today we're going to have a great service, and I'm thinking about Psalm 138, verse one, which says, "I will praise the Lord with all my heart." And the root word for that is yodor. The word root word for praise in that verse is yodor. It's a Hebrew word. And it means to publicly acknowledge God, and I think that's great. Even though we get to watch this from our own homes and lounge rooms, I think it's really important that we do get out there and publicly acknowledge, praise for our God and what He does for us throughout the week and throughout our lives. So,、um, as we head into this service, I would love to pray for us. That is going to be a great service. So, why don't you join with me、uh, as we pray now, Father? We just thank you. For church, we thank you that you love the church, God. We thank you that you sent Christ to die for the church, God. And we just thank you that even though we are scattered all over the world or、um, wherever we are in Australia, God, that we get to tune in and in one body and one spirit, we get to listen, we get to worship you, we get to praise you, we get to be lifted up, God, in your presence. And I just pray that people will feel your presence wherever they are today. And、um, God, that they will actually get touched by you, and and they open their hearts to this service, to、um, what you're saying to them in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. Well, this morning we have Jacques Cronier bringing the word. So we know Jacques is always full of faith. He's always full of praise when he brings the word. So we're looking forward to that. And also, we are going to take communion today. So. Make sure you get your emblems ready for that because we're going to take communion、uh, during the worship song after the message today. So make sure you grab your emblems to join us with that as well. This morning we're going to talk about communion, and I'm very, very excited about this message this morning. And、uh, welcome to the people online. If you joining us, why don't you get your emblems ready? Because we're going to be taking communion together together later on. And so we're in this together series again, finishing up the theme for this year together as a family. We're doing life together. A few weeks ago, I spoke about family, and at church we are a family as well. And so. It's going to be powerful this morning, and I'm really believing that the Holy Spirit's going to do something unique in your heart about the power of communion, and that's why I titled my message this morning, "Communion: Come Boldly to the Throne of Grace." I just want to get stuck into it. I I don't want to kind of you know tiptoe around some of the concepts that we've been dealing with in the past. I just want to get into it, if you allow me to. So that we can go come boldly and have communion later on at the throne of grace. You ready? Amen. Let's get stuck into it. Hebrews four fifteen to sixteen. Bless you, Paul. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what you're going through. He's been there, yet he managed to get through it unscathed without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Come boldly, so that we can find mercy and grace. So, how many of you have heard? The term "don't take communion unworthily." Yes, the other day, it must be I don't know a few months ago, in conversation, I cannot remember who it was or the moment, but I remembered just one thing that stuck out to me. And this person made a comment: "Oh, don't take communion unworthily." And something didn't sit right with me. 
it sounded like, you know, there, there was a bit of a religiosity behind that. And so I thought, I'm going to check this out. I want to make sure when I take communion, what is this thing about? And so in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, that's where Paul actually wrote that statement. So what is he talking about? The whole of 1 Corinthians 11 talks about back in the day, the church of Corinthia had factions. They were divided. They had divisions among themselves. And they came together in their homes to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But what they did was they came together and they threw parties like it was their own party. They forgot that it was the Lord's Supper and they made it a big fuss about them. So it wasn't Jesus' supper, it became Mary's supper or Jules' supper or whoever, John's supper. It wasn't Jesus' supper. They tried to outdo each other. They tried to humiliate people that didn't have enough. They tried to put on a banquet to brag, having bragging rights. They got drunk and disorderly. Sounds like some reality TV we would see these days on TV. They were competing with each other. There was no unity. They were absolutely in the flesh. And they were gluttonous. When they arrived, they just tucked into the meals and off they went. They didn't care about those who didn't have. They just wanted to feed their faces. They were haughty, greedy, selfish, and gluttonous. And that was the unworthy manner in which they took communion. And just to, you know, solidify the point, we can read together there verses 33 and 34 in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul said, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. And if you are hungry, you should eat at home. So that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. Whew. So that means if you have any understanding of who you are in Christ or, you know, of our sinful nature, we can partake in communion. Even sin consciousness can be making it all about ourselves. And forgetting what it's about, forgetting what it's, you know, really about, that it's about Jesus. When we search ourselves, I don't know about you, when you search yourself, sometimes when you search yourself enough, you don't want to take him in anymore. Because you know, a wretched man that I am, there is no good thing in me without Jesus. And I think that's the problem with society at times, that we think we are quite moral beings quite self-righteous in our own right, but without Jesus, we are wretched and broken people. I found this article online about um, this guy called Joe Rigney, and I wanted to read to you what his experience with communion was early on in his life, and we can read together there. My goal, as the elements were distributed, was to make myself feel the weight of my sin. And the horror of the cross, so that I could receive the elements in a worthy manner. A grave, somber, heavy, introspective one. The result is that the Lord's Supper became largely about me retreating into my cocoon to feast on Jesus with a heavy heart. My whole demeanor communicated this through hunched shoulders and eyes staring at the ground, only looking up to take the plate and pass it on. What was noticeably lacking from my experience of communion was the strong sense of awe, wonder, joy, God witness, and gratitude in zeal for gravity. I'd forgotten gladness. God wants to take us communion boldly when we make it about Jesus and not make it about ourselves. We can be glad, joyful when we take communion. Let's read Ecclesiastes 9, 7. Solomon. Now, if you read Ecclesiastes 9, there's not much to cheer about when he writes in there. It's a pretty sad picture he's painting. And then all of a sudden comes verse 7, and it is referring to the Passover feast, where he says, Go eat your bread with pleasure, and you drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already accepted your 
works. And he's referring to the lamb, the slain lamb that has made the people righteous there. But he's also prophetically referring about the coming Messiah. And so the Passover meal, back in the day, they were reading, they were drinking wine, they were telling stories, they were eating special food, singing, and had Passover traditions. Why? Because they were happy because they were going to Exodus, Egypt. They were being released. They were happy. The Passover meal was for their freedom, to set them free. So we can read together again. Joe Rigney carries on. And he says, Picture the prodigal son after his return home. When the father killed the fattened calf for the celebration of his homecoming, he would not have been pleased or honored if his lost son had sulked in the corner all night, muttering about his unworthiness and trying hard to remember what it was like in the pigsty. Such an attitude in itself would not honor God or the graciousness of his father. What would honor his father is if that sense of unworthiness that he felt on the way home from his sinful exploits gave way to a profound sense of amazement that he was actually sitting at the Father's table, fully restored to commune with him. What would honor the Father is if the music started, the Son would dance like he'd never danced before. That is a real gold ring on his finger. Those are shoes on his feet. And that is a robe of inheritance on his back. And he can still feel his dad's kiss on his cheek. Isn't it amazing when we look at things differently sometimes and making it about the Father's love, not about us, how we can experience it in a different way. It's like being given an innocent verdict at a trial that had a death sentence attached to it. We have been given an innocent verdict by Jesus. Would we not be a little bit happy about that? And I wonder sometimes, you know, how would the prodigal brother have taken communion? Self-righteous maybe, complaining, thinking about his own good works, rather than having a thankful heart to his father. So Proverbs 17, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. And that's not just figuratively speaking in the Bible. That's real. Do we need medicine? Does your life need medicine? Do you need financial medicine? Do you need physical medicine? Do you need relational medicine in your life? Jesus is called the great physician, and we can come to him with joy. I wanted to just read again Isaiah 53 this morning together for us to see what Jesus went through. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering. He knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from, despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness. He carried our pains. We in turn regarded him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punished for our peace, our peace, our wholeness, our shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. And when we, we went astray like sheep, and we have all turned on our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us. He went through that to trade places with us. We should have gone through that. Jesus was innocent. He should have been the one to be joyful, to have a bit of a holiday on earth, to have some peace and quiet on earth. But he didn't. He changed places with us so that we can have the fullness of life in him. And that's why healing is a status. It's part of the works on the cross. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and ask Him for anything that we want. He took it all 
so that we can have it all on earth, not just in heaven one day. And that's what mercy and grace is. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, what I deserve. Mercy is withholding the judgment that we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. So Jesus didn't just stop there at the cross and said, okay, I'll give you mercy so you won't perish eternally. He went above and beyond that. He said, okay, there's a line here, mercy covered your sin. Now grace goes further. What's his grace? His unmerited favor. His blessing. Unconditional because of what happened on the cross. Not because of what we have done. And sometimes we get on the treadmill of works, don't we? The righteousness. If we haven't done a good week, we sometimes feel, need to make it up, God. I'm sorry. How do, how do I make it up to you? And he says, all you need to do is come and sit at my feet. Our job is to believe. God's job is the manifestation of his word. And just because sometimes in life it doesn't work out the way we want, doesn't mean that we cannot continue to speak the truth and hold on to the truth of the cross. The scripture in, I think it's uh, Matthew 13, talks about the parable of the seed, 30, 60, 100 fold. And sometimes we only see 30% manifestation of God's power in our lives. We get healed and maybe a little bit, but not fully, 60%. He wants us to have 100% evidence of his works in our lives. But that parable of the seed is about how the seed is received in the soil, in our lives and in our hearts. But don't quit because it's just not working for us or for others because in life our job is to figure out how to manifest everything that the cross and communion represents into our lives. God hates death. Anything that has to do with ultimate death God, is not from God. Sickness, financial poverty, grief, brokenness, nothing is from Him. He hates that. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. And so sometimes we need to understand that it's not because of what He's trying to do in our lives. He's trying to rid us from that. And we need communion to stop sin in its track in our lives. The evidence of sin. Because everything that I've spoken about so far is just our sinful nature. The result of sin. And when we take communion... Communion, stop it in its tracks. And we have the ability to say, Jesus, I thank you. We press pause. We have the ability to say, hang on a minute. There is a better way. There is hope. There is forgiveness. There is restoration. There is healing. There is deliverance. There is provision when we take communion. And so we might say, what about my sin? Exactly. What about it? Jesus has taken care of your sin. And sometimes the enemy reminds us of our sin. But we've got the right to say, hang on, enemy. God's taken care of my sin. My sin is God's business. And he's taken care of his business. I can come boldly to the throne of grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we can read together. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The Amplified says, we would be made acceptable to Him and placed in a right relationship with Him by His gracious loving kindness. You have been made right with God. It's a status. It's not by works. It's not something we work towards. Jesus died and said, you take communion, come boldly to the throne of grace because of what my son did. 
So everything we do is through the filter of Jesus. Everything. If we filter it through us, we're going to struggle. If we filter it through our own failings and faults, it's going to be hard. We have an opportunity today to take communion through the lens and the filter of what Jesus did on the cross so that we can take it with gladness and boldness. So therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace and the table of the Lord's Supper. Eat your bread with pleasure and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has declared you righteous and the cross made provision for our peace. So I want the team to come up. Come up. We're going to sing a song. And the words are very fitting for what I've been talking about today. And during the song, I would like you to come to the front, participate in communion today. Come and grab your emblems. Go back to your seat. Don't take it yet. After the song, I'll come back and we're going to take communion together. Together as a family, standing together, side by side. Because who knows, in a family, if one person's hurting, everyone's hurting. If one person is struggling, everyone's struggling. And we're going to take communion together today and think about what Jesus did. And you can think about it like you've been given an innocent verdict on trial that had a death sentence attached to it. And not only have you been given an innocent verdict to go free, God says, once you're free, I will lavish you with my grace. I want to allow Jesus to put his robe of righteousness on you today. Allow him to put a gold ring on your finger. Allow him for you to feast at his table and come with boldness. Come grab your elements as the team sing and I'll be back after that for us to share communion together this morning. my face, laid inside my tomb of sin, and you were buried for three days, then you walked right out again, and now death has no sting, and life it has no end, for I have been transformed by the blood.
How good is it to sing that song for the blood that washes away all our sin, past, present, and future. Your righteousness is a status. And if you still don't believe me today, maybe this weekend you can go out to the beach and you can stand there where the waves break. And you can stand there with your feet. You can make small holes, big holes in the sand. And when that wave comes and crashes over, does it only cover the small holes in the sand? What does that wave do? That wave covers all the holes. It washes it clean. And His blood washes away all of our sin, even the big ones. And that's why 1 Corinthians 11, Paul goes on. We're going to finish where we started earlier on. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you, his body for you and for me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The old covenant was only a covering, the Passover. It was only a covering, and they had to continuously do it. The new covenant is a permanent covenant once, never again, in perpetuity. That's the blood covenant for the remission of your sin. Do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat it, eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The bread represents his body, crushed bruised, pierced for our sin. Everything that we're going through in life, He's already paid. That's why we can come boldly to want to receive the good things. Jesus is the bread of life for physical nourishment, but also spiritual and soul nourishment. And the blood, the forgiveness of sin, the unseen iniquities in us, The fallen sin nature, His blood represents the new covenant to wash it all away. And that's why we can say what John 6 says. Jesus said, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. 
So this morning, you can take it worthily if you recognize who you are and you recognize who Jesus is. That is what it is to take communion worthily. Knowing we have nothing to offer, but we don't take communion in that fashion. It's all about Jesus. It's about Him. That is taking communion worthily this morning. And I will raise Him up on the last day, John 6 says, Because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. What you're doing this morning is you are making a claim and a stake in the ground saying, Jesus, I'm in you. You are in me forever and ever. Nothing can separate me from your love. I'm secure eternally. But also on this earth, I can ask you for what I need. So why don't you open your emblems? And we're going to have that together now. And as you take the bread, as I said, represented his body, broken, bruised, battered, pierced for this sinful nature on earth. And the blood, the, the wine is his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. So Jesus, this morning, it's all about you. The songs we sang, what a beautiful name. Your name is beautiful because what you did on the cross and you rose, you defeated death. That's why we come to church, to remember what you did for us. We receive your forgiveness, but we also receive your wholeness, your peace that you've come to give us the Zoe kind, God kind of life on earth. So this morning I pray for sickness. People are longing to be healed. And as they take communion, Lord, I pray that you will infiltrate their veins, their cells, their muscles, their bones, every single cell and repair it to how you wanted our bodies to function. If there's financial hardship this morning, I pray that you will provide because the cross even made provision for financial things, physical things in this world. Is there's, if there's relationship problems, I pray your blood, your bread, your body brings restoration, healing, peace, wholeness, forgiveness. Let people's hearts be softened by this act this morning. Because when we are in you and you're in us, we cannot but be humble and tender to each other. Restore families. Let this new generation be one who's raised by godly, God-fearing, honoring, humble people. If people are struggling with addictions, break it right now in the name of Jesus. I come against addiction. I come against things of the flesh that's tripping people up. We break it over people this morning. We declare the power of Jesus over them right now. We receive healing right now. Whatever that thing is, speak it over yourself. Receive it because of the fullness of communion this morning. It's taken care of already. You don't have to work it. Receive it. And the rest is up to God to manifest. So Lord, we're obedient this morning. I just feel as well, if there's a person here, you maybe have not had the opportunity to make your peace with God. If there's anyone here that say, I want to make my peace with God this morning, just raise your hand and we're going to pray for you. And you say, yeah, 
this Jesus stuff are real. I receive it, what He's done on the cross for me, and I want to come to Him and make Him the Lord of my life. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. Jesus, we thank You. We're so grateful that we can come and do this in remembrance of You for the awesome work You did on the cross so that we can live our lives in the Zoe peaceful life that you've planned for us. And if you believe that, you can say, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Shark, for another faith-filled and inspiring message. I really hope that you got something out of that. And I also hope that in worship today that you got to just have a reflective moment around communion and as we celebrated what Jesus did for us on the cross. As we just quickly come around our giving, I, I do love the, the parable of the, the talents and how it says in that that everyone was given to their own ability what talents they had. And I think that the great thing about Macquarie is that we kind of just say everyone had to give what they feel led to do and what they're able to do and that is, it's a responsibility on all of us just to be a part of that. So I just encourage you to give um, as per what God kind of puts on your heart, you can do that online or through the QR code. Belong Collective, you have an event coming up called Belong Bowls. The cost is $5. It is at Bar Beach Bowling Club on November 23rd. So you need to RSVP to the church by Thursday the 21st of November, but it's going to be a great afternoon of bowls, so make sure you get along to that. And then another exciting thing that we have happening is down at Warners Bay, we are doing Carols at the Podium on December 8th. Now, we want to focus on bringing your friends, bringing your family, bringing people in your world to this. So make sure you get along to that. It's a free event. Just bring your picnic rug. Entertainment is from 5 p.m. But we just want to focus as a church that we all bring someone along to this great event, Carols at the Podium, down at the Bay. What comes to mind when people say the word microchurch? Hopefully not miniature figurine, like people, gathering in a miniature building. A microchurch is part of our reach out vision. It is a small gathering of people with a focus on building relationship, community and making disciples. You might be thinking, whoa, church, whoa, micro, that's scary. But micro churches are not really something new. We see the early church doing this so well. For example, in our church, one of the micro churches taking place is our Macquarie Vets. People inside and outside our church community who have served our nation coming together. How good is that? A micro church could be a doorway for people to hear and experience Jesus. Macquarie is facilitating its first ever microchurch training on Tuesday, the 26th of November, 7 p.m. here at the church. The training will clarify and stir passion and vision within you for a future microchurch or help you understand how you can better be a church on every street. Head to our church website to register. Well, next week online, we have Pastor Ros there continuing with our Together series. So tune in for that. But right now, thank you so much for joining us wherever you are. Have a great week. Be blessed, church.